reported feeling anxious. For those, of, for those of us that may experience these feelings, I hope we can acknowledge that we're not alone. We must learn from one another because it indeed takes a village. As a Title IV-E social worker, we are called to serve children in our community by empowering, encouraging, and inspiring parents to rebuild their lives for their children. We must be mindful that we, we, we do not become wounded healers. We don't wanna cause harm to these disproportionately impacted communities. The purpose of National Stress Awareness Month is to remind us that it is essential to think about how we can reduce our stress level by trying to help others. Develop a vision for healthy living, wellness, and personal growth. Take care of yourself, eat healthy, exercise, and give yourself a break, especially when you're feeling stress. We call it self-care. So as we dive into today's summit, we have the opportunity to build collaborations, be inclusive, and end isolation with the goal of reducing stress while gaining trust in the child welfare workplace. Let us remain diligent in understanding that these conversations cannot exist without acknowledging our personal and professional stressors. This may seem easier said than done, but I believe if we come together and put self-care into practice, we will accomplish many things. With that being said, I'll hand it over to Paula Quintanilla to introduce our next workshop. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paola Quintanilla, and I'm a member of the workshop committee and a student at San Jose State University. Uh, thank you for joining us in this workshop, Racial Equity Agency Leadership Team Efforts in Child Welfare, that will be presented by Clarence Cisneros Jones and Clara Torres, both of whom serve as social workers in various capacities for Santa Clara County. Mr. Cisneros Jones is an LCSW and psychiat psychiatric social worker with over 20 years experience working with marginalized families throughout the Bay Area. He is a certified healing circle facilitator and aligns his actions with leaving the world a better place than how he experienced it. Mrs. Torres is a proud Chicana and daughter of immigrant parents from Mexico. She has more than 20 years experience as a community advocate and currently works with the Santa Clara County DFCS Racial and Equity Unit. She passionately, passionately advocates for people of color and oppressed groups. We're excited to have you both here and we look forward to your session. Give it up for our presenters today. Thank you everyone. And that energy was perfect because I think we're gonna we're gonna use that energy to, for this uh, presentation. So before we begin, this is so um, perfect. We would like you guys to uh, go ahead and join us in the physical activity. It's not gonna be nothing hard. So just, you know, and there's a purpose to it. So if you all can just stand up. All right, not gonna be hard and do not hurt yourself. I don't think there's workman's comp in here. So do, do what you can with the activity. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna raise our hands up as much as you can with the intention of giving thanks for the sky and the moon and the stars and the universe up above. So as much as you can, don't hurt yourself. And then we're gonna do the same, but down. As far as you can, don't hurt yourselves. And with the intention of giving thanks, Mother Earth, to the fruits and vegetables, Mother Earth, and everything that, um, that is provided by Mother Earth. And think of, you know, the weather and the rain and the sun as well. All right. And then you're going to stretch out your arms out with the intention of thinking about everyone in our community, in our country, 
think of your ancestors, wherever they come from. If you don't know where they come from, think of who raised you, your caregivers, your neighborhood, and then bringing it back to your community and the families that we serve. And then finally, and most important, and it's not selfish, most important, yourself, social workers, you're awesome. We are awesome. We have a difficult job, an important job. And so a lot of times we don't acknowledge ourselves and people don't acknowledge us, right? So this is our chance to say thank you to ourselves and we are valuable and we are awesome. Right. Hopefully you guys all enjoyed that physical activity. So I'm Clarence. Uh, we did the, the physical activity. We're going to do the land acknowledgement and uh, also talk a little bit about some group agreements because it is definitely important to have those when we engage in these conversations. So just starting with the land acknowledgement, right? We want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. We are the original peoples of this land. We recognize that we benefit from living. Well, who are the original peoples of this land? And we recognize that we benefit from living, working, and learning on their traditional homeland. We affirm their sovereign rights as first people. In addition, we want to also acknowledge those who are immigrants or who have migrated to this land and now call it home. Um, you know, we mentioned San Jose State. I'm a San Jose State alum. I was a Title IV-E student, like many of you, and I was one of those. I'm only doing two years with the county, and I'm out, right? And here we are, close to 10 years later, still with the county. I'm in staff development, and I'm actually training social workers, so I'm, I'm like all the way pot deep, right? But Same in 20. Yeah, right? <laughs> So it happens, it happens to all of us. So it wasn't long ago, I saw myself sitting there and, and looking up at these things, but looking at how far we've come, right? To be able to acknowledge these things, right? Um, we're gonna do some tone setting, right? And, and I really want us to understand that because a lot of the history here of America, right? There's, there's three things that I usually like to start with, right? And we have slavery, colonization, um, and patriarchy. Right. And that's a big part of how America was designed. And that's a big reason why we have a lot of the disparities and disproportionality that we see even now in 2023. Right. Because that was the design of America and it's resulted in a lot of these things. OK, so we really want to do some tone setting and look at those things through that lens. Right. And how those have impacted our communities of color and why we are where we are today. Right. It's not really a mystery when you follow the lineage. OK, so land acknowledgement is a big part of that. Right. Through colonization. We've taken land, right? We haven't, the people that were originally on these land didn't get credit for a lot of that, right? So San Francisco Bay Area, Oakland, all where I'm from, San Jose, right? So there's a lot of land that people were living in. So that's why it's important to acknowledge some of these things. <clears throat> Group agreements, right? So when we talk about this, right, we have this idea in uh, Santa Clara County where we talk about brave spaces and I'm also getting trained uh, by Dr. Uh, Melanie Turvalone uh, on cultural humility. And one of the terms that she used was uh, necessary spaces. So anybody have any idea what that means? What are brave spaces and necessary spaces? Any idea? There's a hand? Sorry, there's lights blinding me. If there's, oh, okay, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, with the with the with the pigtail puffs. I see you, sister. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Very true. So brave spaces aren't necessarily safe spaces, right? And I want to be clear about that, right? I'm not up here to guarantee anybody's safety, right? When we're having these conversations, right? And a lot of times what ends up happening is that the folks that are usually being harmed, which tend to be people of color, right? Have to maintain this certain safety for the folks that are feeling kind of attacked. And it's usually white folks, right? So to maintain whiteness, right? And this idea of whiteness, right? There's people of color that are being harmed that often have to quiet down to, um, 
in keeping the idea of whiteness, I think there's a lot of uh, comfort that goes with safety, right? When, we, when we're looking at that, right? And when you're a person of color, we're in discomfortable conversations often, right? So we have to understand how to maintain that. But when we're protecting whiteness, we tend to put those together, right? There's this comfort that we associate with safety. We have to move past that because it doesn't allow conversations to continue. And it doesn't allow other people's experience that have been harmed to be able to really express those things, right? So a lot of times people are getting frustrated, they're getting triggered and they're lashing out. And then we're saying, oh, we can't have conversations with black folk because they get too angry, right? But they've been harmed, right? And we're not dealing with the harm, we're trying to feel safe right in these spaces. So today we're going to talk about how do we get to the necessary spaces and that's a lot of the things that we're doing with our county and it's hard work, right? So some of those things in the group agreements come down to these things that I put in here. Listening to understand. And I was in the the fatherhood uh training right before this and that's a lot of kind of what they were saying. We got to listen to understand. And what I mean by that and they they could, they did a great example too of uh expressing that and sometimes when we're listening to people, we're already having responses in our mind, right? And I've done that, you know, we're not being present. I've done that even with my own kids, right? They're telling me stuff. I'm thinking about other things I have to do. And then my said, daddy, did you hear anything? Huh? What are you talking about? Right? I didn't hear any of that. I'm just saying, uh-huh, right? Or just going on giving responses. We really have to listen to understand, right? Listen as if the person talking is the wisest person in the room, right? And really understand what they're trying to say and hear their experiences. The other thing I like to talk about is reflect and not deflect. And what I mean by that is often when we're in these conversations, there are things that happen that may trigger us. And we often start to deflect. Why did that person say that? They just came here, right? I don't think anybody got up this morning and drove out to Oakland just to start pissing people off, right? Not at this conference, right? Wasn't it. Maybe there might be some outliers here, but most of the folks in this room didn't come here to piss you off directly, right? We're all learning through this. So when things come up for you, it's important to look at what's going on inside yourself that's upsetting, right? Because the other thing, and again, I'm an LCSW, I'm a therapist. Other people don't control whether we get upset or not. We control that, right? But we like to deflect and put it on that person. It's, well, they did it. They said, if they never said that, I wouldn't be upset. Well, you got to figure out the things that are going on with you. Reflect on those things, right? Before you deflect on that person. Being honest and transparent, right? We have to talk about some of this historical context. Again, like I said, slavery, patriarchy, and colonization has resulted in a lot of things. We have to be honest and accountable about that, right? We're a government agency. People do not want to work with us, and they're justified in that. I wouldn't want to work with CPS. I have my own children, right? I'm a black male. Don't. I have... I don't call the police very often. I don't want police at my house, right? We have to understand these things when
people. So we have to look at that history. All right. Is that echo going to be there? Should we switch? <laughs> Is that okay? Can you hear me? Okay. Still kind of echoey. It's a little oh. echoey. Does it bother you guys? Bothers you too. <laughs> it's a little weird. Sorry. I was, uh, was going to try to work. Well, to the uh, Saturday Night Live again. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> what was that lady? What did she say? Uh, she was the. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Testing? Good? Okay. Thank you all. All right. Let's get back. So, a little bit, I um, want to take a little step back of why we're here. First of all, we're really honored to be here and talking to all of you. And I'm really honored to be presenting with Clarence. Uh, I call him my hermano, he calls me hermana. And, and it's not just saying it like, you know, we got each other's back. And that's important because that is part of the work that we're doing. The things that you see us role modeling is what we're doing at our work site. That's why we're doing it. Um, we're not just doing it to be like, hey, look at this, you know, this is so fun. No, we're actually doing this. And I want to say that we don't know everything. Like, we're not claiming that this is the way or this is the best or do what we do or that's not what we're doing either. We're showing you all a little bit of what we've done in Santa Clara County in the past two and a half years, actually started right before the pandemic. And um, and really the things that have worked, and then also the things that we still need to work on, right? Um, breaking white supremacy and institutional racism is hard, and it's not an overnight job. And one of the things that Clarence and I, you know, I try to remind myself, because I'm a doer, I'm like, let's change this right now, let's, and we'll talk about how we did try to do that, and then we were like, met with a big stop. This is not a sprint, it's a marathon. I say that to you, but I say it to myself too, because I get frustrated, right? When we were like met with resistance. So we're here to share our story and uh, we're trying to do it in a storytelling way, but also showing you all how we do it. So I hope that you all uh, appreciate that. It's not, we don't want it to be the linear lecture. We want it to be a circular, fun activity, dialogue, Platica conversation style. So who are we? We're the DFCS Real team. Yay. <laughs> and Real standing for a racial equity agency leadership team. Right. And we take a lot of the things that we learned from Government Alliance on Racial Equity. There's a conference coming up in June, everybody in Oakland. If you can go, I would recommend it. Um, you just Google it and you'll find it. So we get some of our, our work from there. Some of our work that we're showing today from the National Compadres Network on the circle keeping, they do training, look them up, they're awesome. They, do on, they don't only do circle keeper, they also do joven noble, so targeted to uh, male identified folks. And then they have also a female identified curriculum, I think it's she not sleep. So look for that too. Um, and then finally, the other person we were recently getting trained on is Dr. Ken Hardy. Also awesome, look him up. He's got YouTube videos that talks about a lot of what we're talking about. So those are people give credit where credit is due, right? Um, we've borrowed all kinds of stuff from all kinds of people. So we've been meeting, um, I don't have the thing. We've been meeting uh, consistently for the last two and a half years. We started meeting like every week and then we, we decided uh, we needed a space too to process things. So we have a work meeting and then we have a workshop and then we have circle at the end of the month. And so going to the point earlier of our colleague who was presenting at the beginning talking about taking care of self, super important and not in the like superficial way, right? But truly like taking care of yourself, like truly kept checking in with each other, like, you know, calling a, a, your colleague or your comadre or whoever's your support person, really doing that, you know, especially all of you who are just entering the field 
this is, this is my support group right here. Here's our picture, right? This is who we are. We're a diverse group of people and it happened naturally. We're like, hey, who wants to join this group? And then all these people that you see here were like, I do and I do. Different uh, backgrounds and I don't have to tell you, we have it written down on the next slide, but, um, but it's important to recognize that we come from different backgrounds. Dif we have employee groups in Santa Clara County, by the way. I don't know if other counties have this, and you'll see the list also on the slide, but we brought the leaders in. So these are all of our groups, that these are employee groups at the county, they're volunteer groups. We do this on top of our work time, but it's important because if we didn't have these groups, we wouldn't have certain things like bilingual pay, bilingual codes, Vietnamese, Spanish, translation of forms, African ancestry unit in ER, a newly formed Chicano Latino unit in non-court. I mean, these are like brand new things. Two new Native American indigenous workers to work with folks with ICWA. This is brand new. This is all what the real team had adv has advocated for. So, and we have union leaders from both our uh, SCIU worker chapter and also supervisor chapter and the management team has their union too at Santa Clara County. And so we've all been working together. Don't think we're all like, hey, we're all happy family. I mean, sometimes, right? But sometimes, no. It's, you know, sometimes we're like, hey, Clarence, well, what about this? And, but we've learned to build trust with each other. And so we learn to like take the time to get to know each other so that when we do have those disagreements, we could be like, you know what, Clarence, when you said A, B, and C, it kind of hurt my feelings, or I kind of felt like this. And he's like, oh, I didn't know that, you know? And then we could talk about it, right? I'm telling you really quick, it's not that easy. <laughs> it takes a lot of work, but um, again, necessary, difficult conversations, but trust is key. Relationships are key. So that's, uh, what, okay. So again, governmental liaison on ra racial equity. If you Google anything on racial equity in terms of like how to start, and this, you can Google race forward. They're also, they have a toolkit. Um, GARE has stuff online. And anybody that you Google, the first thing you gotta do is you gotta normalize the conversation defining terms. First thing you got to do. We learned that. We didn't do that. We went to like, let's change policy and let's, and then we, and then we were met with the resistance. Learning lessons, right? Um, hopefully you all don't meet that resistance. But that's what we did. And we were like, oh, we got to go back to normalizing. We got to go back to defining the terms. Yeah. So if we can go to the next. Oh, okay. Before we do that, we have a video we want to show you all. They will tell you it is just a symbol. They will say that it is simply statues. They will try to downplay the vestiges of white supremacist remnant, that which is left over often stronger than what was there before. Civil wars, pot liquor, but ain't no healing in this broth. The Confederate flag is America's swat sticker cut from the same cloth. For over a century, we raised a glass to the losers. We toasted traitors and tipped our caps to constitutional abusers. We let democracy dance with the daughters of the Confederacy. And now the reckoning. It feels unsettling, threatening, like a knee on your neck by those sworn to serve and protect like using the last gasp of your breath to scream for a mother who is dead. Big Floyd just wanted to touch the world. You can see it happening in the face of his beautiful little girl. Streets across the globe filled to the brim 
in support of BLM, social unrest, this a necessary societal function. But the little known secret is that growth often resembles destruction, endings can be beginnings, reinventions, reimaginings onto a blank canvas. And so in honor of George, we are not taking this life for granted. However, we are taking down the granite, marble and bronze stone memorials that honor that which is deplorable. We are courting the good trouble of racial justice and equality in a manner that is historical. They will tell you it is just a statue, that this is just some symbolic victory. But if the past is prologue, then the preface to our future is history. And 2020 appears to be the year that much like perfect sight, we might finally begin to see things clearly. So that brings us back to a lot of uh, 2020, right? Some of the stuff that was going on and the significance of that. Um, I know for me, that really motivated me and pushed me into the real teamwork, to be perfectly honest, right? And at that point for the county I was doing, uh, I was facilitating child and family team meetings. Um, so I was seeing a lot of stuff, right? I was seeing a lot of, a lot of things that were going on as social workers were engaging with families. And one of the things I started doing specifically was really speaking to that, right? Because I knew as a black man, George Floyd was on my mind, right? The, the way things were happening, race relations were on my mind, having two uh, biracial mixed ethnic, ethnicity children, right? My wife's Latina, hence the Cisnettles Jones in my name, right? Having those two children, right? Two sons, that stuff was on my mind. So I felt like I needed to do something, right? And I spoke about that. And I will kid you not, it was really like a, a release of tension for every black family that I spoke with. And I would just address it right in the beginning, right? And talk about these things and disparity and disproportionality. And they would all just kind of calm down and start doing the meeting, right? You could see that tension just leave for them. And it wasn't something that their social workers were addressing with them or saying. And I kept telling them, you know, you have to understand these things are on people's mind. We can't just gloss over and act like they're not thinking about these things. We're making safety plans and telling them to call the police if things are getting out of hand. We really need to think about what we're telling these families specifically and the, and the times that we're in, right? We can't just blindly do social work, right? So that was very important. With this uh, slide right here, any ideas of what this is kind of getting at, this dialogue discussion um, reference? Any ideas, anybody? Yeah, yeah, right? Trying to find that balance. And really what we want to look at, right, is increasing dialogue more, right? When we think of dialogue, it's more in conversations, right? Where two truths can happen, we're hearing people's sides of things, right? When we're having discussions, I look at it more like a lecture, right? Where somebody is up there, uh, kind of like I am in front of the room and speaking as the expert and everybody's just taking that in, right? It doesn't leave much room for dialogue or conversation, right? So when we're having these uh, conversations, we really have to move from the discussion lecturing mode and understand that we all have things to bring. Everybody has different experiences and to come at these things with more of a conversation, right? Not just the lecture. I am, as I do more trainings, I am also learning and being humble in the fact that I don't have to have all the knowledge, right? Just because I'm up here doesn't mean that I'm the most knowledgeable person about this, right? I heard a, an Asian proverb that none of us are as smart as all of us, right? So collectively, there's knowledge in this room, right? I don't have to be the holder of all that knowledge and the expert just because I'm standing up here in front of you. And again, in our traditional teaching and the way that we are, um, and I equate a lot of this stuff to, you know, this idea of whiteness, where even when we go to schools, it's not a mutual learning environment all the time, right? It's the professor, it's the person standing in front of the room that has all the knowledge, and they don't always believe that they can learn from the students or the learners, right? 
we have to reframe that. We have to get out of that mind of thinking, right? And, and I really try to do that, right? So all of you guys have knowledge as well. And hopefully we'll get to the points where we hear some of those things, right? But really kind of reframing how we even have any of these dialogues and conversations and moving from that discussion lecturing piece is really what we want to do. So I put this, this one in here, right? It's um, got a lot of folks in here, right? A lot of, lot of things uh, that come up that can resonate with, with several of us, right? The Black Lives Matter, uh, we got MLK, we got Cesar Chavez, I'm from San Jose, right? That's big. Black Panthers are on there, we out here in Oakland. Those are some of the first uh, social workers. A lot of people just think those brothers just walked around with guns, but they don't talk about the homework programs and the breakfast programs that they do. And a lot of stuff that we talk about doing now for a lot of these communities, the Black Panthers already saw that need and did that, right? These were educated folks, right? These are PhD educated people, right? That a lot of times we just look at, oh, they were just the guys running around with guns, right? Um, I also find the irony in that, like we talk about uh, gun laws and, and how um, hard it is to change that. When the Black Panthers had guns out there in the street, we found ways to change the gun laws, just, just so that we know that, right? Just keep that in mind. Side note though, you know, I'm not gonna go on too much about that. But one of the things that you know, I, put, I put up here, um, this slide for a couple reasons, right? One is that this education continues. We continue to learn about the different leaders in the struggles. And one that was new for me was the Stonewall Inn and looking at uh, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, who were leaders in the trans community. And, I, and I'll admit, I learned more about this this year, right? I didn't know much about that or, or those struggles, right? And so the Stonewall Inn, if you don't know about that, happened in 1969 in New York. And that was a like hotel that was very friendly to the LGBTQ community. Right. And it got raided by the police for really no just cause, just because they didn't like that community. Right. So it led to a lot of riots. And uh, Sylvia Johnson, I mean, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, you see them in the kind of black and white slide second, top right. Um, one's kind of walking with holding up the sign. Um, we're big leaders in that. Right. So I learned, I learned about those folks. So again, one, we can always keep learning right, about different people's struggles and how people have contributed to these struggles. And the other thing that I really want us to take from this is that when we start looking at uh, disparities and oppression and discrimination, it's not an Olympics. It's not a comparison of whose trauma is worse, right? We have to move to the mindset. And I know that we're not there yet and we, and we do need to do some healing and there's healing that needs to be done specifically in the black community and the Native American community, but none of these things are exclusive, right? We have to move to the point where we're against oppression of all kinds. And it starts with educating ourselves on the struggles of everyone that's been oppressed, right? We have to be warriors against discrimination and oppression of all kinds, not just against black people, not just against Native American people, gay folks, LGBTQ, you're on your own. It can't be like that. We have to learn more about each, each other's struggles. We have to have these conversations, right? And I'll admit, I didn't know that much about the trans community and some of these struggles. I knew some stuff about gay rights, but this was a new one to me, right? And that's why I wanted to highlight that. Some of these folks are familiar. Some of these may not be familiar, but we should all be aware of these folks and their struggles, right? Because we have to be in this together. There's a program manager with the county that we work with on the real team. So the brother, I call everybody brother and sister, right? Uh, Don Long, uh, one of my Asian brothers, he calls us uh, Jedi warriors, right? So basically justice, equity, diversion, and inclusion warriors, right? We have to be that, okay? We have to be connected to each other's struggles, learn more about each other's struggles, and in our communities, lift each other up, right? And that doesn't always happen. We got to get away from the struggle Olympics, right? And comparing this person had it worse because it doesn't get us anywhere. And again, those are some of the tools of the oppressor, right? This divide and conquer techniques that don't keep us unified and doesn't help us move forward, right? We can't dismantle oppression by using the same tools as the oppressor. Can't do it. We all have to be against oppression. So that was a big reason why I put that slide in there. 
So, you know, looking at this quote, systems impact and disproportionality. All organizations are designed intentionally or unwittingly to achieve precisely the results that they get, right? Our systems are not broken. Our systems are doing what they're supposed to be doing. That's how they were designed, right? When we look at law enforcement and you look at the history of law enforcement, there's a reason why there's a lot of folks of color that get arrested more. Law enforcement originated out of slave catching. That's the origination of it, right? And towns had independent militias that can go down and find a black person, ask them for their freedom papers. And if they didn't have it, they're taking them back to the slave owner for a price, right? We see a lot of that happening now, right? When you're walking down the street, a police officer can start walk up to you and ask you for your ID. That's illegal. They can't necessarily do that, right? We have to understand the origins of this. So people say, well, our police system is broken. It originated out of this concept of hunting down black bodies and bodies of color, right? And asking them for their identification. And we're still there to this day, asking them for their freedom papers, right? So these systems are designed in a certain way to do those and achieve the results that they get. And again, why we have issues of disproportionality as we start to look at that, it's not a surprise when we look at slavery and we look at the history of some of these things, right? <clears throat> All right, here we go. So one of the slides I put in here, some, some stats, right? So as we talk about, I think we missed the slide, huh? Was the disproportionality one? But the words weren't up there. Yeah, so on this one, there's supposed to be uh, definitions of disparity and disproportionality. I don't know what happened there, but that's all right. I can just read them out to y'all. Um, so I have them here. They weren't up there for some reason. So when we look at disparity, basically it's the disparate or inequitable treatment or services provided to children of color, non-white, compared to those provided to similarly situated white children, right? So if we have two families, a black and a white family, and they're both in pretty much the same category as far as uh, financially, how much they make, right? There's a disparity in the services, or even if we have a family that maybe makes the same, or they're a Latino family, they don't speak the same language. And what I mean by that is, let's say we're referring them to therapy, right? It's gonna be much harder for me as a black family to find a black therapist that I could relate to. If I was a white family, we're gonna get a white family, we're gonna get a white therapist, right? It's pretty easy. If I don't speak English, it's gonna be harder for me to find a therapist that speaks my language. I'm a white family, it's not gonna be as difficult, right? So those are the disparities. So even if we're in the same socioeconomic status, we're making the same amount of money, we need similar services, my outcomes may be different based on those needs, right? That disparity. Mm -hmm. and, and I just thought of, um, we said we were gonna free flow. So I just thought of something real quick. Um, and it relates to the conversation, the session of fatherhood. Yeah. So, um, which by the way was awesome to the presenters. Um, one of our colleagues did a study not too long ago from San Jose State, and he was looking at fathers that were specifically a Chicano Latino, and then fathers that were white Caucasian. And what he found was that the social workers, and he found most of our white fathers were older and had jobs, you know, were employed, had housing. Our Chicano Latino fathers were younger, um, didn't have jobs, you know, maybe were incarcerated and physically, you know, looked different, had tattoos, you know, just uh, looked different. And so what he found was that the social workers treated these fathers differently, and this is a disparity, the Chicano Latino fathers were given more difficult case plans, so longer things to do and difficult, like 52 week batters, or you have to go to X place and you have to travel, you know, just more hoops. And they uh, took longer to reunify. Whereas the white fathers, boom, you know, short case plan, doable, and they reunify faster. I mean, that's glaring disparity. Yeah. Very true. Right. And then the same with disproportionality is it's the idea of you know, higher numbers of, you know, certain populations that interact with our systems that are usually higher than the population that is in that community, right? So um, sometimes that could be a confusing stat to look at. 
So I changed it in a way of just looking at children investigated out of every 1,000, right, uh, children in Santa Clara County. So these are specific statistics to our county. And I got these off the, uh, our child, California Child Welfare Indicators Project, which is out of uh, Berkeley. So I know we have some Berkeley folks here. Um, but this is all public information, right? You can go on there, you can get these statistics. Um, it's kind of nerd side of me, you can play around, you can look at different counties, it has all the counties in California, right, so you can look at all of them. So what I did was just looking at, out of all the children investigated out of a thousand, right, because I think it's a little easier to look at that rather than looking at the population of African Americans in uh, Santa Clara County, which is not very many, it's a very small population, right, but you can see that out of a thousand children that were investigated over half, right, we're, we're black families, right? We're looking at close to 58%. And again, our population of African-American folks in Santa Clara County is not very large, right? I think our largest, larger population is Latino and white. And we have a pretty large Asian population as well and a very uh, low Native American population. But over half, over half of those children, right? Being investigated and keep in mind when we go out to talk to families, do we just talk to the one child that we're out there to investigate if that child has brothers or snow? We talk to all of them, right? So this is a whole family, right? This is not just we go out and talk to that one child, right? And these are all children zero to 17, right? After they're 18, they're adults, right? So these are families. So if a family has two or three children, over half of the kids in Santa Clara County at some point will be under investigation. That's how we have to look at it right which is which is crazy okay this other uh statistic really looks at the disparity right and so you know it looks the first three colors are really about the allegations the investigations and the substantiations and then the last two that yellow one right there and then this this other one right here uh are basically looking at when we go after substantiations, that looks at removals and the kids that remain in the system. Um, and that was supposed to be up there, but it's not, that's all right, I'll flow through it. So when we look at these things, you see that from the substantiations, there's a significant increase in the removals, right? Especially when it comes to black children. This is all compared to, to white children, which is why we don't have the white children on there. So this is all the ethnicities compared to white children. And so the only ethnicity that does a little bit better is our Asian and Pacific Islander one. But everybody else, you see that significant jump from substantiations to removals, right? For black families, it goes from 6% to 10%, right? For the uh, Native American families, it's a huge jump, right? From one and a half percent to almost 8% that we go from substantiating something to removal. Right. And the same with Latino families. And then, you know, in some of this work that we're doing, we're trying to see what helps because we're seeing there's a decrease in the children that remain in custody after being removed. Right. And that's kind of what that last stat. It's not that much where it's significant yet. Right. Where it goes from 10.68 here to nine point whatever it is. Right. It's not a huge significance, but it's a decrease. So after those kids are getting removed, it's showing that there's a decrease in them remaining in care, in custody, right, in, in DFCS. So hopefully it's some of the work that we're doing, but there's still a lot more work that we need to be doing, right, to, to really combat some of these numbers. And hopefully that kind of makes sense. Um, there we go. So the data is important, even though, I, honestly, I'm like, ah, I'm not a data person. When I see that stuff, I'm like, I have to put on a different thinking cap, but that's just me. <laughs> Clarence is really good. I'm like, okay. Um, but it's important because what we learned again, if we're trying to make changes within our child welfare system and our, in our counties, what they're gonna tell you, what they told us and what they keep asking us is where's the data to prove it and, and show us the numbers, right? And so that's why we share that with you all so that you know you can do the same. Be informed about your county and your community so that you can speak to it in a professional way and so that those in power will listen to you, right? So again, modeling what we, we learned. Um, so normalizing conversation. I love pictures. This is, so equality is not equity, everybody, right? Yes, I think this room understands, but not everybody does. 
Equality is equal. We do not need equal. Clarence and, and his families or my families of my background, we didn't need the same thing. We may need, have needed different things. My family was an immigrant family, didn't speak English. We needed translation. We needed also to be careful because of documentation, right? Different needs, not better than or worse than, no oppression Olympics, right? And, um, and we're still working on that, but we have to keep saying it. Equity, giving people what they need. We don't all start off the same. So, and then here's your, you know, eliminating racial disparities so that improves outcomes for everyone. And there's a longer definition for you all for reference who provided two for you. And you could take these with you and share them and use it in your work. So part of what we started with, right? <laughs> Again, I'll tell you the um, learning lesson. I won't call it a mistake, but we're like, you know what we're gonna do first, you know, before we tackle like changing the system is we're gonna tackle promotions and hiring. Yes, right? Yeah. Uh, we were like, yeah, we want to um, we want to have representatives that are diverse in interviews. We want to have racial equity questions, and we want everyone to get trained on the HR policies and procedures. <laughs> and then uh, we were met with, mm, wait, why? Why do you want to come into interviews? Why? And I'm not trying to put any of those folks down, right? Because everyone is in their own racial equity journey. That's something else I have learned. I have had to learn, right? Because I was upset. I was like, why, how come they don't get it? Why aren't they doing it? And, and the reason is, is because they didn't understand, right. right? And so that's the purpose of normalizing conversation and defining terms and doing all that so that we all understand. And then also, so then we could all be like, okay, so what do you all think we should do to change this? Right now, believe it or not, after two and a half years, we are being invited to interviews. Not all of them, but some of them. And most of them are the promotional ones. And now they are including racial equity questions. I don't know if they included those of you who have interviewed in Santa Clara County, but if, if they did, yes, that's the real teamwork. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so, um, you know, progress takes time. So that's objective one. Objective two, we want to have racial equity embedded in everything from budgeting, from decisions, from staffing, everything. And then three is creating partnerships with the community. So we met with like parents. This is another thing, right? Talk to people with lived experience. Talk to your community about what changes are necessary. I'll tell you one thing that the parent or two things the parents said, and this again, um, backing up the fatherhood uh, session earlier, they said, can you all just treat me with respect? Can you just like talk to me like a human being and don't come in and attacking me, one. Secondly, can you stop giving me a cookie cutter case plan? Oh, so it's not just us? <laughs> oh, okay, oh, yeah, validation. Right. Let's stop the cookie cutter case plans. I tell her, whenever I meet, I, I do a co-facilitate a, a women's support group and I was doing a men's one and I'd be like, do you have drug testing, parenting class and NA support group or NA meetings? Yeah, how'd you know? Like, yeah. That's what we do. Let's and, stop that. And therapy. Oh, and there, yeah. And uh, therapy. Don't forget therapy. So, and then these are racial equity questions. Feel free to use them, take them, borrow them. They're not, they're just questions. So they're there for you all too. And then this is some of the work that we've been doing in terms of, um, we've started with the equity and justice series and Clarence has been a part of staff development. You know, he can speak to some of that, the tone setting he's done. We've done processing groups, healing circles. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the work. And what time, how are we on time? Because we have an activity we want to do with you all. Okay, we have a little bit of time. So um, we have till 2.15 for a QA, and a but we wanted a role, oh, thank you. We wanted a role model, um, a circle with you all. So we're, I think we have some volunteers to help us. Mm -hmm. And what we're gonna do is, um, again, National Compadres Network is the one that trained us on circle keeping. And we're gonna show you how to do it. That doesn't mean you all can do that though. That one you can't borrow and steal. That one is, that one is you gotta be, you wanna sit up here with us or how do we, yeah. Um, that you gotta get trained, you gotta shadow, you gotta go through their processes. So just disclaimer, but we wanna show you all 
how we do it. And this is what we do once a month and we've done it with other folks. But um, so yeah, here we go. All right. <clears throat> go to the, here we go. All right, so uh, Carla and myself were trained to do these, right? So we lead a lot of these, these groups. Um, with the county. Um, and I have started incorporating some of this stuff into training and really just helping us all heal, right? And, and talk about ourselves and um, get to know ourselves more. So we go through kind of this, this list of questions. And, and really, again, the idea is uh, this is not, you know, I'm a therapist, right? It's not a therapy group, right? We're not, we're not up here processing and, and going through that, which is hard for me as a therapist. A lot of times I want to respond to people, right? But that's not the purpose of this, right? This is really going through this process and having that belief that the collection of all of us, right? Us all having this knowledge, us all being part of healing, right? Racism, oppression, it's not one person's problem. It's all of our problem, right? So it's all coming together to do that. So we start this process by... Usually I'll do like something like the activity that we did or some tapping or some breathing, but for time, we're not gonna do all that. Um, and then we, we really kind of go into it. There's some ground rules of what we share here stays here. Um, just kind of share what you need, just enough to get past. And again, it's not a therapy. So you don't have to go into your childhood traumas and everything that's going on. It's not a therapy session. Just talk about what's happening with you. So we talk about who are you, right? So I, I will start with that and uh, we will pass it down. So I am Clarence uh, Cisnellis Jones. I'm a partner. Uh, I'm a father. I'm an uncle, um, cousin. I'm a son to my father, Clarence uh, Jermon Jones Sr. and my mother, uh, Lillian Carlita Jones. I am a social worker and advocate, um, many different hats, right, that, that I wear aside from just what I do. Who do you represent personally and professionally? I think a lot of times, you know, I represent my children, right? It's a lot of why I do what I do. I represent, I grew up in, in San Jose, on the east side of San Jose, so I, I represent a lot of my friends that I saw go through child welfare and people that I saw get locked up, some folks that I know still are, are serving some time. Mm. Um, but just representing a lot of that, like my community, you know, the place that I'm from, San Jose State, right? I went there for undergrad and grad school. Mm -hmm. So I represent that, right? I represent Santa Clara County. Uh, what gifts do you have that can support families? You know, I really try to listen. I try to heal um, and really just try to be with people on their journey, not, not take it all on uh, myself, right? And and have that, but really just be part of people's journey, right? And, and help them with that journey of healing and empowering folks. And um, again, to like shine the light, the, the meaning of my name Clarence is to uh, shed light, right? Shed a real bright clairvoyant light. Um, so really trying to shed light on, on people and families and who has helped to contribute to your growth and these gifts. Uh, I most certainly credit my sons, my eight and four year old uh, son, Lazarus and, and Ezra, because they most certainly helped me grow and help my patients. I consider myself a pretty patient person before I had my own kids, but they most certainly helped with that. Uh, I've grown in those areas even more. Um, and, you know, my, my family, my partner, um, my real team, my colleagues definitely helped me grow. And I will pass it on to you, Justin. Thank you, Clarence. Uh, how's it going, everyone? <clears throat> my name's Justin Martinez. Um, I'm 32 years old. I'm uh, oldest of four siblings. I'm a partner. I'm a coach. Uh, I'm a student. Uh, you know, I, uh, I'm an intern at, at Alameda County uh, Child Welfare. I'm a social worker, uh, proudly. Um, I'm former foster youth. Uh, I really bring that passion and experience with me, uh, moving on to like who I represent personally, I represent myself first and foremost, um, SF State, uh, Gator, proud to be a Gator. Um, you know, my internship, Alameda County again. Uh, personally, I represent, you know, being a partner. Um, being a man uh, for my siblings, um, 
yeah, uh, a role model for them, uh, a support system for my mother, uh, even, even a support system for my father, um, who could use fathering, you know, nowadays. Um, what gifts do I bring uh, that can support families? Uh, a lot of compassion, uh, a lot of empathy, uh, patience. Um, I have this, this gift of just like making people feel seen and feel comfortable with sharing uh, the hard times that they're going through and not judging them on that really just seeing people for who they are and not for the mistakes that they've made. Um, Cause we're not the worst thing we've ever done. You know, uh, I bring, I bring that with me too. You know, I'm a flawed person and I wear it proudly. I'm constantly learning. Who's helped me to contribute to my growth and these gifts. Yeah, everybody, um, my partner, she's very, very understanding. And uh, man, I couldn't do it without her because things have been tough in grad school. I know we all understand. Um, my mom, she's my best friend. Uh, my brothers, they're my rocks. I look to them. I look up to them, even though um, I'm the oldest. I wear a lot of weight, carry a lot of weight on me, but, uh, I really just try hard to, uh, let them know that, that they mean the most to me and they help me, um, stay inspired to get up every day, even when I don't want to, because there's those days, there's those days. Um, my father, my father, you know, he's, uh, yeah, inflicted, you know, pain in my past and uh he's helped me want to learn more about my history and get to know my my grandfather and his pain as an orphan and <laughs> you know the cycle continues mm -hmm. you know being in foster care and the pain that he had passed on to my father and how that you know showed up in our life um but he's always been that strong hero in my life uh, to give me that tenacity to now, you know, be a first generation college graduate, going to grad school. I, I can't even imagine how I would be able to get here if it wasn't for like wanting to show my family that that's possible and share that with my community with other children, with families, you know, letting them know that, uh, I mean, just because I've done it doesn't mean everybody can do it. Some people are running the race with, with shoes on and some people are running races with blisters on their feet, you know? Um, but, but for him, you know, uh, for my family to be that man uh, that, that leads the way uh, as a change agent to be up here, uh, I wouldn't change the thing and that all happened for me. So that's what's helped me contribute to my growth. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, hello, I am Erica Thomas. Um, I am a student at San, uh, San Bernardino. Um, I work for DCFS. I am a daughter, I'm a mother, I am a sister, I am a partner, I am a student, I represent child welfare, I am a black woman, um, and that's who I am. Who do I represent personally and professionally? Um, I think I represent all what I just listed um, in every space that I enter. I um, try to make sure that how I represent um, every one, every role that I listed previously, I try to make sure that I show up in my best form and make sure that I show up in a way that shows possibility, shows strength, um, shows compassion. Um, 
And I try to echo that professionally, making sure that I enter spaces and always show up strong, confident, and fallible because we all are. And knowing that I'm not, um, I, I, I know nothing if I know anything, right? Um, the gifts that I have to support our families, um, listening is a huge, huge thing. Um, before entering um, child welfare and social work, I worked in hospitality, which taught me a lot about listening. <laughs> um, you're often told you are wrong and you have to bite it and just be like, okay, you're right, I'm wrong. But how do we move forward? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think that having that skill set helps me work with the families because a lot of times they just want to know that what they're saying is being listened to, yeah. that we're taking their words, their experience at face value and making sure that we're implementing that and how we show up in their lives. And I try my best to remember that in any space that I enter to, into. Mm -hmm. um, who has helped me contribute or who has helped contribute to my growth and these gifts? Um, my children, 100%. Um, I would be nothing without them. I did not understand life before having kids. <laughs> um, you truly understand what it means to sacrifice your all when you have children. And I try to bring that into how we engage our families because no matter what, kids love their parents, no matter what they're going through. And I try to enter situations in, with that in mind, like I'm, I'm not here to villainize, I'm here to learn and I'm here to support. Um, so, and of course my partner and my family, um, they all contribute to how I show up in this space. Thank you. Take time, I'll be quick. Okay. Hi, whoa, sorry, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Surprise! I'm Annie Rose Status, and I'm a student at Cal um, CSU Dominguez Hills. I'm also a daughter. I'm a sister. I am an aunt. I'm an improviser. I am um, an artist. I'm a lover, and I don't mean in that way, but like in a loving way. <laughs> way okay too. Also in that way, yeah. <laughs> We don't judge you. We don't Moving judge on. Judgment-free zone here. <laughs> this, this is my share, my, my circle time. Um, so who do I represent personally and professionally? So I always think about people I grew up with and myself too, who grew up in poverty and, and just with hardship and struggles, but also friends who I saw go through the child welfare system, two friends who I had who were murdered through gang violence. I represent them and I represent the voices that they didn't have and the voices that their families didn't have. Um, and I represent people who are wanting to create a more beautiful world. I represent them and do work where they're not able to because they're too stressed out, too overwhelmed, whatever it is. Um, gifts that I have that can support families. Oh, I also represent white people who are willing to be accountable. I'm willing to be accountable for harm that white people cause and also the harm that my ancestors have caused. So I represent that. Um, gifts that I have that can support families. I'm very loving. I am willing and happy and delighted to see people for who they are and to let people be known and to walk into a family and say, you don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to do any of that. I'm here to see you and love you and support you and allow you to be who you are. Um, I'm empathetic. I deeply listen. I'm willing to do the work um, and just be there for human beings. Um, who has helped to contribute to my growth. So I've had a lot of privilege <laughs> as a white person. And so there's all of that. Also, my educators have been amazing. I've been really lucky to have great education. My family, um, my friends, my loved ones, my partner, um, people who I've met traveling around the world who have just showed me different perspectives and helped me open my mind and learn more about who I am and who I want to be. So I think that that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you. So that was worthwhile. We went a little over time, but we want to allow for Q&A. 
but that was very special. And thank you for sharing what you all did. And I hope you all felt that's the circle, that's the power of the circle. And sometimes we get really, really deep and, but yes. we've this created, is this is, yeah, this is a quick circle, but anyways, yeah, really quick. But, um, and really quick, I'm Carla Torres, mother, daughter, tia, comadre, friend, strong advocate, represent immigrants, represent uh, civil rights, represent community activism and social workers. And that is all that I will share for today. Um, so Q&A, we wanna give you all a chance to either ask questions or comments or whatever's come up. If you wanna you know, uh, share. And we have one more video that's really important that'll really bring it together. And I like sports too. <laughs> so this is from the NFL, the video we're gonna show. So, and go Warriors, go Oakland Raiders, even though now they're Vegas Raiders and Oakland A's don't leave. Anyways, that was my share. Okay, <laughs> so uh, Q&A. Anyone have questions, comments, anything they'd like to share, anything that's percolating that? I don't know. Are we getting a copy of the slides? Yes, yes, you are. Yes. Oh, yeah, yes, we would. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, I went to Cal Berkeley, too. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. So we do have representation. Like the the brother I was talking about, Don Long, is a program manager uh, there, and we've definitely heard a lot of his stories because one of the things that came up with COVID was a lot of hate crimes, right, against against Asian folks, right, and so hearing some of that and on on elderly. Asian folks in particular, right? So really looking at some of those things and him helping us understand that just because their numbers were looking good, that's an area that we may be underserving, right? So because of the way that we sometimes look at the Asian population, like they're doing well, they're you know very affluent, they're doing good, we may not be serving them as well, right? So we have some biases there and some things that we should look at, right? And addressing that doesn't mean we need to start bringing in more Asian babies and, you know, getting involved with more Asian families. But that is an area that could be a blind spot that we're not looking at because traditionally they usually have resources, right? They usually have a level of privilege. They're not usually in the same poverty as, as other families. And the ones that are, we're not, we're not serving, right? Because we kind of consider them doing well. So even there might be families that we could be doing more with and helping them more, especially if they don't speak the language and we're not, right? We're just kind of passing them through the system and saying, well, they're, you know, so Asian family, they'll be all right, right? And so really helping us look at some of those things as well, right? And we have two other members. So Don and Diran Misuk and yeah. the other uh, issues that have come up in our department uh, that both our El Comité is the one I'm a part of and the API group is that um, the deletion of codes. So Vietnamese right. speaking um, is the uh, second largest language in our county. That And so we've been advocating for translation of those forms as well as Spanish. And we've been doing that uh, partnering, whereas it's not APIs, you're not alone. Right. We're doing it together. So thank you for that question. It's not the race Olympics. No, back each other up. Right. Other comments, questions? Yeah. I could really use it. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, 
right where a lot of us are. I mean, to be honest, and you know, this is a video we show to you guys and we show on the real team, but this isn't a video that we're showing to the whole agency either, right? I don't think in a lot of ways we're there yet. And that's why it's so important, one, to start visualizing what you want your agency to look like, and then to really start normalizing these conversations. And that's the hard part. I, I would say we're still very much in the normalization stage where mm -hmm. some of us are speaking the language and some of us are still learning, right? It, it's, it's various degrees and still combating, uh, you know, different terms and terminology that, that come up, right? And reverse racism is one of those things, right? That we mm -hmm. really have to look at and what does that mean and move away from that, right? There's no racism, reverse racism, right? It's, it's just racism. There's just oppression, right? There's all these extra terms that we put onto things, we really got to normalize these conversations and break that down. What, what do you talk, what is reverse racism? What is that talking about? We're against racism of any kind, mm -hmm. period. There ain't no reverse racism. One of the you know, biggest lies that we've all been sold in America is that there's not enough resources for us all, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have to vie for resources if you're of this uh, underprivileged community. That's a lot, that's not true. There's no evidence that says that. Let's really combat that narrative, right? Mm -hmm. there, there is enough resources for all of us, right? I'm a hip hop uh, fan, so I know Jay-Z said, if you put crabs in a barrel to ensure your survival, you're gonna end up pulling down brothers that look just like, you didn't use brothers, but you get the point, right? <laughs> That's what happens, right? You put us in barrels, we have these communities of poverty, right? And people are pulling each other down because they feel like there's not enough resources. And that's a lie that America has sold. There has to be someone on the bottom for other people to succeed. That's a lie. We have to change that narrative. It's and, not true. And so we have, yes, we have three minutes. Oh, thank you. Yes, three minutes. Perfect. And um, just one more thing to that point is, and I didn't say this, and it's very important. We could not have done the work we did without the support of our executive director. Very true. Um, he has been very supportive, as well as some other executive, our agency SSA director. And so they dedicated, they made a position for this, everybody. Yeah. And, uh, she got it. and I got it. Yeah. It just happened. <laughs> But one more. Okay, we have three minutes and we want to show the video. So one more question and then. Um, can you guys hear me? No. <laughs> so my question is, um, when you talked to me, I heard your discussion earlier about agencies not being held accountable for the unequal treatment um, as far as participation plans and how there's lawsuits for certain folks. Yeah. Hello? Yep. Okay. Um, how can new social workers increase that equity? Is there anything we can do to try to fix that problem? And yes. secondly, um, how can we incentivize agencies to stop like racially based uh, mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those things come up, right? Uh, I think some of the things that to look at are like the blind, blind, uh, you know, like when you're looking at the cases and like really taking out any information that talks about ethnicity and just really looking at it, right? So you kind of have that that blind removal aspect. I, mean, I think it's it's difficult, right? And I, and to be honest, like a lot of the issues that lead to the disparity and disproportionality is really around poverty. Right. And so really educating social workers about some of these dynamics of poverty, because those are the things that we see. And those are the things that make people feel uncomfortable because they're not used to certain levels of poverty. And that tends to keep and obviously there's reasons that our families of color tend to be in those neighborhoods and those areas. And we can get into, you know, the codes and, you know, all those type of things of why. But poverty is, is one of the biggest issues. So really helping social workers understand that and how families function in poverty so that they can see some of those resiliencies and some of that, right? And that'll make us feel better about getting out of those families' lives. But it's, you know, it's a hard thing, right? Creative case plans. Yeah. Creative, Creative plans. think out of the box. So if we can show the video. Yeah. All right. Thank you all day. for your questions and comments <laughs> and being patient and listening to our story. Bring it in! Today, nothing else matters. As long as those beside you and those behind you know that you got their back. Who got my back? I got your back. Who got my back? I got your back. Who got my back? I got your back. Who got my back? We got your back. Who got my back? We got your back. Who got my back? Who got my back? Who got my back? Who got my back? Who got our 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 back? Who got our
my back! And we got y'all back. I ain't going to say the NFL has it all the way together, but this was a good video. <laughs> Not at all advocating that the NFL has conquered this equity thing. Oh, we didn't follow the Oh, we have things to give away. And we do have giveaways if people are interested. We got a lot of little swag stuff. So. Okay, thank you everybody for that incredible presentation. Give it up one more time for Santa Clara County Racial Equity. Thank you again for welcoming the Brave Space and um, all the sharing participants up here. Uh, I would like to allow you guys to, this leads us into our break. So we hope that you take advantage of the next 15 minutes to grab a quick drink, a bite to eat, uh, take a few deep breaths, or even my favorite, uh, take a cat nap. Uh, <laughs> taking the next few minutes for ourselves uh, can give us the energy to check back in for the second half of uh, this, um, this presentation. Trust me, you don't want to miss it. And for the remainder of the program, please return back at 2.45 p.m. for the final presentation. Calling it as it is, addressing African American disproportionality. We'll see you back at 2:45 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 
Hi. Hi, everyone. We're going to get started, so please take your seats. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. If you could all settle into your seats. So welcome to the final session of the 2023 Cal SWEC Title IV-E Summit. This panel is called Calling It As It Is, Addressing African-American Disproportionality. By the way, you probably remember, I'm Annie Rose. I'm from CSU Dominguez Hills. I was also supposed to introduce myself and I'm from the workshop committee. So I'm very honored to introduce these five panelists. They're going to share with us their insights and wisdom that they've gained from their work in the African-American Disproportionality and Child Welfare Work Group. The work group is a collaboration across California State Universities in Chico, Fresno, Stanislaw, and Long Beach that produces important educational content for students, faculty, and practitioners across child welfare. This panel will show us and illuminate how practitioners can use data to identify child welfare disparities and implement revolutionary change to address disproportionate representation of African-American children and families in child welfare. Joining us today are Chelsea Cornell, MSW. She is a Title IV-E Child Welfare Project Coordinator at the CSU Chico School of Social Work. We also have Mika Klungvet, she is an MSW and Title IV-E Child Welfare Project Coordinator at CSU Chico School of Social Work as well. Elizabeth Pringle Hornsby, EDD, all right, all right, uh, EDD and MSW, and she is a Title IV-E Child Welfare Project Coordinator and lecturer at CSU Long Beach School of Social Work. Janelle Thompson, she's an MED, PPSC, LCSW, and also a Title IV-E Child Project Child Welfare Project Coordinator at Stanislaus State University's Department of Social Work, and Cheryl Whittle, PhD, LCSW, PPSC, and a Title IV-E Child Welfare Pro Program Coordinator at the CSU um, Fresno Department of Social Work Education. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to our panelists. Wow, those introductions are a lot for us to keep living up to, right? <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's see. The first is technology. Oh, wait. Bring it up. The wrong direction. See, technology. Okay. So, um, Again, my name is Janelle Thompson. I'm really delighted to be here as a former Title IV-E student, UC Berkeley alum, 18-year teacher at Cal State East Bay when it was still Hayward. <laughs> and now I'm down at Stanislaus. And we could not do this be here, begin to talk or begin any kind of interaction without again, just making sure we touch base about the land acknowledgement. I won't read it again because I think the, our predecessor um, right before us went through it and did a very good job. But I will say, and you will notice, there's gonna be some repetition in terms of definitions and thoughts about how we're supposed to function as we do this work. And that's okay, because we know as adult learners, we need to hear things over and over and over again. And at different times, when we're in different spaces, mentally and emotionally, and our readiness is at a particular place, we're able to take it all in much better. So again, we acknowledge the land that we are here resting on. And if you have not, you can use the link that's below on that slide to find out where you reside and or work and whose original land it belonged to. So, 
So we're going to uh, review our agenda here briefly. We'll have some introductions, have a little poem to share. We're again gonna talk a little bit about disproportionality and disparities. We're gonna talk about our personal and professional mindset, who we are when we walk in the room. Evolutionary versus revolutionary change, what that means. This concept of a 15% solution. And then we'll revisit the poem and maybe you'll be in a different place, emotionally, spiritually, cognitively, and it will sit differently with you at the end than when we began this process. And right now for a few introductions, I will turn it over to Elizabeth. If I can use this mic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janelle. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Awesome. I know it's been a long day. So just hang in there with us for a few more minutes. So I'm Dr. Elizabeth Pringle Hornsby, and I'm the CalSWAC Project Coordinator at Cal State Long Beach School of Social Work. I've had the pleasure of working with this uh, group of magnificent women over the last year and a half to bring to our students um, over the four universities that are represented um, before you today. So we're gonna share a little bit about what we've been able to accomplish with our students. And um, hopefully you'll walk away with inspired, but also with some information about how you can move towards doing some of the work that we're trying to do. As a part of this, uh, work group, we wanted to share a little bit with you about um, not just who we are, but what has been our process getting to this place. Before I do that, um, we've already had a quick introduction, but I just wanted to re-acknowledge um, the, the panel that's before us. So we have Chelsea Cornell to my left, your right, from Chico State University as the CalSWAC Project Coordinator, Dr. Cheryl Whittle, who's at the farther uh, left, all the way at the uh, close to the end down there, uh, CSU Fresno, myself, uh, uh, Janelle Thompson, our facilitator for today, and then Mika Kongvet Moreno, uh, who also co-chairs the CalSWAC project, um, I'm sorry, CalSWAC uh, program with, uh, with Chelsea here. So as a part of getting to this place, just want to share with you, like most of America in 2020, and 2020 when things shut down. The CalSWAC or the Title IV-E project coordinators also experienced our challenges in terms of looking at what are we doing as CalSWAC project coordinators or Title IV-E project coordinators addressing the issues of disparities and inequities. Every year we have an annual evaluation and that annual evaluation in 2021 provided us an opportunity to look at what are the things that we are doing to bring curriculum to students to address issues around disparities, inequities, um, disproportionality, and how that shows up uh, in our communications with our students. In completing an evaluation with our colleagues, we realized that we needed to do some of our own work, that we were spending the time with you as students, and we wanted to make sure that we were providing opportunities to bring that curriculum into the spaces um, that we show up every day with you. And so that is where the journey began. And just as a reminder, there are 20 universities across the Cal State, uh, the California system providing the Title IV-E programs. And so though the 20 uh, project coordinators are not on this panel with us, they were a part of the process of talking about what do we need to do as um, Title IV-E uh, project coordinators or CalSWAC project coordinators to address this issue. So we had a, uh, an evaluation and the, your project coordinators provided us with some feedback about what are some things that they're doing at their universities to share with you issues around uh, 
disproportionality, disparities. And we'll talk a little bit more about what some of these definitions mean. And I'm sure that many of you are addressing this in your universities, but we wanna make sure that we're all on the same page as it relates to these um, terms. And so having done some of that, we had an opportunity to present to the, uh, the CalSWAC project coordinators in terms of some of the work that we're doing and what we wanna do as a committee. But more importantly, the four universities that are represented here um, before you today decided that we also wanted to collaborate um, by hosting a presentation with Dr. Jessica Price. Many of you have probably heard about Dr. Jessica Price in terms of some of the work that she's done on blind removals and her work um, that she's done at Florida uh, State University. But we invited her to come and talk to our students. And in doing that, some of the information that we're going to share with you today is some of the concepts that came out of that presentation, but it also represents the work that this committee is doing uh, to look at how do we have a statewide approach to providing the content that you need to go out into the field and practice to help you to understand some of the, the responsibilities that we have as social workers in the communities in which we serve and how we show up every day as we knock on those doors and we're in these families. So that's a part of what we're wanting to do. So in uh, January, 2023, we had uh, Dr. Price come in where she was able to talk about strengthening families using a racial equity lens. So we'll share some of that information with you today. In addition to that, we've also collaborated with Dr. Um, Wanjiro Ghali, who's with the Academy for Professional Excellence, where we've been able to discuss with her some of the work that she's doing with the Cultural Responsiveness Academy, specifically the African-American series and how we may be able to incorporate some of that content into the curriculum that we're developing as well. Though we've had an opportunity to look at some of these um, researchers and presenters, we are continually looking at ways and we might be able to look at other uh, curriculum and frames of reference. So just to throw out some other um, presenters across the state, and some of you may be very familiar with them as they may be faculty in your universities. Dr. Wendy Ashley, Dr. Alan Lipscomb, Dr. Joy DeGruy, Dr. Rita Cameron Wedding, the Child Welfare Information Gateway, the National Child Welfare Workforce Institute, and the Child Welfare Indicator Project are some of the areas in which we have drawn from in terms of the content that we will be using today, but also looking at what are, what are some of the teachings, preparations, trainings that these other organizations are doing and how we might be able to use them. So that gives you a little bit of frame of reference that this group has been doing since um, the fall of 2021. We've basically met uh, every other week uh, to look at the work that we need to do. So hopefully the information that you will be presented today will inspire you and motivate you to do some of the work that needs to be done in your communities and universities. So thank you. Next, I'll turn it back over to uh, Janelle Thompson who will share a little bit more information. So I wanna start us off by sharing this poem by Charles Osgood. And some of you may be familiar with it and some of you may not. I want you to think about this poem in context of your work, the work that you have committed yourself to as potential and future child welfare practitioners. There was an important job to be done and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody couldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anyone could have. So as we think specifically in this work that we have been researching and looking at around African-Americans and disproportionality in child welfare, thinking about all of the contributing factors that have gotten us to this place, thinking about the fact that 
we can't just abolish a system as sometimes is presented as the option or suggestion because that doesn't change the root. That doesn't change the underlying issue of why things were created and where they originated from. So when you think about those contributing factors and a poem like everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody, think about that line worker. Think about that intern. Think about that supervisor or management team. Think about all the various laws. Think about the systems that are all in place. And think about the data. I don't know about you, but when I hear about data, when I was in Berkeley trying to finish my project, I broke out in hives. I'm like, data, <laughs> data, oh. But data is so important because it moves us beyond the place of an emotional response. And yes, I do have a very strong emotional response as a woman of, a woman of African descent. When I look at the numbers in child welfare, it is fully blown emotion. But what has to partner with that, what must partner with that is the data because people need proof, not just a feeling. And so Chelsea is going to, have a chance to talk to us a little bit about how we incorporated and understood the data, not just for one county, but we can look uh, statewide and Northern California in spe specifically. All right, thank you so much, Janelle. Hello everyone, I'm so like honored and privileged to sit up here to have been able, not working, is that better? Do I have to talk about being honored and privileged again, or did you hear that? <laughs> okay, so I'm honored and privileged to be sitting up here on this stage um, with these amazing, brilliant women. First of all, we the work we've done over the, the last year and a half has, has taught me so much and helped me grow. And, you know, we're always all growing and learning from each other, and that's just so vitally important. But what I'm ex especially happy to do is look out at all of you that are doing this work in child welfare and as a as a social worker who worked um, directly with children and families for 15 years in the child welfare system and yes it is flawed and yes we have a lot of work to do um, and that's why we are all here together as a committee as um, because of the work that's needed to be done but as as I was listening to my colleagues speak I was just thinking about all the families lives that I was able to touch in a way that I feel really proud of and um, I want you all to feel proud about the work that you're going to be doing and are doing and are interning in because it's really important work and as Janelle mentioned the system is not abolished we have the system we have right now and it's all of our uh, responsibility to make changes and shifts and how we can do that personally is is where we can start right so that's a big uh, reason that this committee uh, came together in the first place the slide that you're seeing here in front of you is the same that our um uh, the same website that our uh, the panel right before us had used and talked about. I tried to commit, convince the committee that I didn't need to come up here anymore because public speaking is not my favorite thing and they covered everything, but I'll try to put a little spin and shift to it and hopefully it'll feel helpful and beneficial to you all um, as a uh, reminder, adult learning, right? So, yeah. So this website is a collaborative between um, UC Berkeley and the California Department of Social Services. And what it does is it brings all child welfare outcomes together into one place. And th this, uh, this data is all public, uh, open to the public. Anyone can pull it up and look at it. Have any of you used this website? Are you familiar with the Child Welfare Indic uh, Indicators Project? I see some hands, okay. Awesome. Well, you can go and look it up and we have some really great resources in your participants folder. I'm not going to ask you to do that now, but uh, Mika and I have, have used and have um, the group really asked us to bring some of those activities to this group in terms of our curriculum development. So we have shared them with you. You can use them for yourself. You can use them with your students. You can use them at your work sites to really help people people understand the data because it is really important as the previous panel talked about to show up with data for folks especially folks are all at different places right we heard that this morning everyone's at different places in terms of their their work and, and their understanding of how this system is impacting um, communities 
specifically brown, uh, black and brown communities disproportionately. So um, this work group really um, came together with this idea that uh, we really need to believe and understand that disproportionality and disparity is alive and well and really impacting the child welfare system. It's real measurable and it permeate, permeates throughout the system. It's causing immense harm to tra and trauma to black and brown communities, families and children. And we are all responsible to do something about that. And this committee really wants this conversation to continue um, and believes how it, that this conversation is one of the most important conversations for our system to be, to be aware of and to be working towards change, right? So um, disproportionality, I'm sure most of you understand disproportionality and the definition, but I'll share it. Disproportionality occurs when the proportion of one group is either proportionately larger, which would be overrepresentation, or proportionately lower, which would be underrepresentation as compared to that same group in the general population. So the first piece of data I'm gonna share with you is data that I pulled off this um, California Child Wonder Welfare Indicators Project in terms of disproportionality of black children um, in the child welfare system. Not quite yet for that slide, sorry. Um, <laughs> so um, African-American children represent about 5% of the population in California. However, they represent 20% of the population in foster care. That's disproportionality, big disproportionality. In compared to white children who represent 30% of the population in California and represent 21% of the population in, in the child welfare system in, in foster care. So you can see black children are very significantly overrepresented in child welfare while white children are underrepresented in child welfare. Now we're gonna look at disparity. Okay, next slide, thank you. Um, so disparities, as our previous panel also talked about, um, is when one group is, is a, a, a experiencing unequal outcomes um, compared to another group. And this data was pulled from this pro, um, the, the Child Welfare Indices um, a database. And I just wanna read this off to you and then we'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing here. So when we look at these five different touch points in, in child welfare, so allegations, those phone calls that are coming into our system from mandated reporters or concerned citizens, right? Allegations, investigations, when we go out and investigate, substantiated allegations, entries, and in-care rates. So allegations for black children in comparison to white children, black children are 3.08 times more likely to have a call and an allegation made against them. Um, compare, black compared to Latino. By the way, the terminology for ethnicity that I'm using is the terminology used at this, uh, in this database, just to clarify that. Black compared to Latino, 2.24 times more likely to have an allegation. Compared to Asian, 5.86% more likely. Compared to Native American, 1.23 times more likely. Com um, investigate it. So once the allegations comes in, the uh, likelihood that black, black children compared to white children are going to be investigated, they're 3.4 times more likely to be investigated. Same allegations um, and 3.4 times more likely to be investigated. Latino children, 2.27 times more likely. Um, black children compared, compared with Asian, 6.4. Black compared with Native, 1.3. Black children for substantiated allegations. So once there's an investigation, they're gonna be 3.46 times more likely to get that, alle that um, allegation substantiated than their white counterpart, 2.18% more likely than their Latino counterpart, uh, 9.25 more likely than their Asian counterpart, 1.06 about the same as their Native American counterpart. Entries. So now that they have a substantiated, substantiated allegation, they're going to enter four times more than white children, 2.79 more than Latino children, 13.95% more um, times than Asian, Asian children, and about the same as Native American children. Once they enter, um, the in-care rate is going to be going to increase uh, 5.39 more like percent, 3.39 times more likely to be in care than white counterpart, 3.41 more likely than their Latino counterpart, 22.17 uh, 
times more likely than their Asian counterpart and 1.22 more likely than the Native American counterpart. So as you look at these, uh, this, this is all disparity, right? And you can see the numbers for the most part continue to grow. So the first interaction with the child welfare system, the outcomes for black children continue to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And not on this chart, we also know that when children, black children in care, um, the research shows us that they're less likely to reunify or, re or it takes longer to reunify with their families. We also know that they're less likely or it takes much longer to achieve any other type of permanency other than reunification. Um, and often we see black children aging out of the system at disparate rates compared to their counterparts. So this committee felt like it was really important that the, the data is understood. And also really important that you all know how to find this data. So when you need to have conversations about it, you're able to do that. So I really, really encourage you to go pull those resources, utilize those worksheets we've provided you in your, in your handouts um, and, and, and learn yourself how to, to pull this data and share it with folks. Um, so I just wanna take a minute to let you turn to your partner. I'm really curious and we would love to hear as a committee, is this surprising to you? Are you aware of this? Is this um, something that, or basically, how has this impacted you looking at this in this way? Just a few minutes to chat with each other. And those of you who are on live stream, I don't know if you can put it in chat or in the question area. She's doing good. You're like, I'm not funny. And then you're like, cracking jokes. Yeah. Where did that come from? Yeah, really, huh? She turned it on. You're almost done. No, you're doing fine. Chelsea's doing good. I was, I was looking at me. She's like, would you ever she she was giving me the I was mesmerized. Yes. That's why I looked at you. I was like, oh, I probably look like I love hearing all this conversation. <laughs> you see how they're It looks like you guys are having great conversation and I hate to break it up. I hate to break it up and bring you back to us. We would welcome an opportunity for a couple of tables to maybe share um, a bit of their reaction and all of that discussion with us. Any volunteers? Yes. There's a mic coming. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, something <laughs> that me and my two friends over here talked about was that all the information about the Asian community has been really surprising because unfortunately none of us are surprised by statistics of black people being overrepresented. It's not a surprise. Um, but we, we have another good friend at this table, me. She's from the Hmong community and I get to hang out with her a lot. And we were talking about how in the Asian culture, they're really good at keeping what happens in the home in the home. And they have a lot of extended family that can take kids. And then we were talking about how Black and brown communities tend to be over-policed by law enforcement, but then I think that also creates a culture that they're looked at a lot more by everyone. So those are the main points that we talk about over here. Awesome, yes, wonderful, thank you. thank you. Is there maybe one other? I see a hand in the very back. So we do have some people who are in the um, live stream chat Yay. and some of the comments that they had were, I was aware there was disparity, but the numbers are shocking. Um, they're talking about how it's disheartening. Um, the fact that disproportionality was recognized as an issue 
20 plus years ago. And it doesn't look like we've progressed much from that. That's right. Yeah, it, it is disheartening. Um, but that just means we need to keep plugging at it. You know, you have to think of yourself is uh, is the drip of water that made the Grand Canyon, right? It's just drips over decades and decades and decades. I can say that when I first started in child welfare to where it is now, it actually is better. It still has a lot of growth. It might be like toddlerhood growth, but we have to keep at it and not give up. Is there maybe one more table that might be willing to share? Oh, social workers. No, no. Okay, all right. I'll let y'all, my students know that they get violent told all the time. So I won't call on them today. I will turn it back to Chelsea. Okay, we're ready for the next slide. Um, I just wanted to spend my last few minutes just talking about some of these or presenting some of these contributing factors. Um, doc, uh, this, this work comes from the work of Dr. Um, Alan Detloff, who many of you probably have seen his work, heard him talk, he's a, a leader in the Up End movement, as well as Dr. Jessica Price, who um, we've already heard and is an amazing, brilliant woman doing really great work around these, uh, around disproportionality and disparity. But uh, contributing factors, disproportionate need based on disproportionate number of children and families of color living in poverty. And by the way, when I look at these contributing factors, one thing comes to mind when I look at all of them together, all of them exist because our society is based on white supremacy and none of these things would exist if we could address that issue and start working towards changing that issue in our policies, um, in how we think as individuals, in the um, way we interact and exchange with people. Um, the second point, racial bias. Thank you. Um, racial bias and discrimination uh, indiv uh, by individual social workers. All of us have implicit and ex explicit biases that impact the people that we work with and how we treat each other. We have to be aware of those and uh, control for those. Um, community reporters. We already saw that um, we are. We just looked at the disparities in terms of who gets called, who gets the most calls to child welfare, right? Um, that is because of bias, uh, racist thoughts, um, et cetera, by those who are calling implicit and explicit biases. Institutional racism and systems are practice policies and laws. The panel before us talked a little bit about this uh, in really powerful ways. The lack of resources for children uh, um, and families of color involved in child welfare, cookie cutter case plans, not acknowledging what people really need to get well and, and, and to, to make change, um, not understanding the supports and, and, and letting our own biases sort of dictate what we do with families. And then geography, um, concentrated neighborhoods living in poverty and other environmental factors, including visibil vi uh, visibility bias that our student over here, I, I think you're a student, I'm sorry if I'm getting, okay, yay, good job, <laughs> uh, right? Um, over surveillance of black and, black and brown communities leads to additional reports. Um, so I'm going to stop there and thank you for your time and we're going to move it back over to Janelle. So again, our title is about calling it as it is. We don't have to make it up. We don't have to pretend. It's right there in our face if we look at it. We look at the data. We look at our own individual practice. We look at uh, those reporters. We looked at the systems that are in place. So we're just calling it out because it's the things that are kept in secret or shaded that get to continue and have negative outcomes for us all. So we want to just continue to shine the light. And part of this response that I'm saying now is because the great student reps, when they reviewed our materials, they had certain questions that they wanted to make sure we addressed. And one of those was about what is the it? What is the it? So looking at the data is one aspect of what the it is that has to be called out. But another it that has to be called out is who we are and what we bring to the table when we walk in the room. And Cheryl is going to address that. Thank you. Let me get my, let me lower that mic down. And I'll also have to watch it because I do have a, 
a deep booming voice. So let me know if I'm too loud for you as well. Cause I was brought up in church and my dad was a minister and we didn't have microphones. So we had to learn to project our voice when I was singing in the choir. So <laughs> we... <laughs> all right. So my name, I already gave it to you and I'm actually um, very proud. I'm a I'm an alumni also of the Title IV-E program. I was actually one of the first participants in the Title IV-E program when it started. Thank you, I graduated in uh, 1994, probably before some of you in this room were even born. And I don't care. Um, <laughs> and so I'm still standing. Um, I have been had the good fortune to be part of this work group and uh, we'll be spending some time talking about mindset. I, um, you know, we had thought about when the first presenters, we keep referencing them and I got so tickled when they were presenting earlier because I said, man, they laid the foundation for us. And then here we get to come in behind them and just reinforce and, you know, bring some, some additional content in. So this has just been perfect for me this afternoon. And so somebody earlier had mentioned about the, one of the videos that they had shown and said, hey, you know what? I couldn't show this in my agency. And so that directly relates back to mindset. And so mindset, you know, as you probably already know, it's a set of deeply held powerful beliefs that shape your perception about yourself and the world around you. It's a framework for work and life. It's the lens from which you view opportunities and your ability and the ability of others to overcome challenges. So it influences how you think, feel, and behave in any given situation. So for example, when people encounter different situations, you know, your mind triggers a specific mindset that directly impacts your behavior in that situation. So anytime you walk in a room, you start sizing people up, right? That's directly attributed to your mindset. You've had experiences throughout your life, you know, that have impacted you and that continue to impact you. Your mindset can also change over time. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that. You heard us mention earlier that uh, Dr. Joyce Price, you know, had, um, we had attended her, um, her uh, presentation and, sh and she shared a lot of valuable information. And one thing she really uh, spent quite a bit of time talking about was your mindset. And she talked about three different mindsets that impact the work in child welfare. And one of them is segregationist. And so a segregational mindset, uh, that's where people have a hierarchical power uh, structure in mind. They feel that people have little to no power to contribute, that they have the, they hold the power. Um, so it's more of a top-down approach. They have no hope that people can change. They feel they have the answers. They're there to uh, save the clients from themselves. You know, they're very punitive and blaming in their, in their approach. They use othering kinds of language, us and them. Um, they have a more of a fixed mindset about how things should be. And they typically label people as permanently inferior. So, you know, you can see how that person would really um, struggle in terms of trying to engage with clients who are culturally different from themselves. Okay. And then next, there's an assimilationist mindset. So this is where you, where a lot of social workers tend to kind of fall into this category due to the way we're trained. You know, uh, people, you know, have been trained to and taught to negotiate for power. You're taught, oh, power can be shared. You know, we, um, we can negotiate with you. And, but yet, and still, but, you know, we, because we've been educated, we've been taught, you know, the proper ways to work with uh, within communities and with clients, you know, we listen to people, but we still remain the authority. Um, and so we still feel, you know, to a certain degree that, you know, uh, we have the answers when you're an assimilationist. Uh, 
So the work comes from a rehabilitative approach, feeling that people can be helped. Uh, standards are based on a white heteronormative value system, you know, which is used as a benchmark for families. So you can only imagine that makes it tough for a lot of culturally diverse families that we work with to reach those, those standards. We, we heard in the previous presentation about the case plans being set you know, with the bar higher for the, for the uh, African-American and Latino fathers, right? You all remember that I was like, yeah, check, there we go. That's a great example of that, okay? So the work is focused on saving the family. And so when the work focuses on saving families, it also creates codependence when the focus needs to be working on helping to strengthen the families. I used to tell families that I work with, I'm not always gonna be in your life. My job is to work myself out of your life. I'm not gonna be with you, you know, until you retire, you know, or I retire, you know, and they would laugh, you know, but, you know, I meant that genuinely because you know, I really saw that as something, you know, that was my role as a social worker. So, you know, also within this, people are considered to be temporarily inferior, but still capable of change. So the social worker is more as a guide, okay? And then there's the anti-racist uh, mindset that Dr. Uh, Price talks about. And this is where power is more shared. You heard earlier, people were talking about valuing, you know, clients where they are, working with people as people, accept, accepting them where they are, starting where they are, that people are valuable just as they are. And that's important to think about. People are engaged as equal partners. You know, there's a belief that people are already enough, that you know, and there's a look at equity. I love those slides that they had shown earlier also, you know, in terms of equity, because this is also an important mindset that's part of the, of the anti-racist mindset. You know, it looks at the needs and how they are addressed, you know, and how is it that people can get those needs met in a more equitable way, okay? There's also a belief in being adaptive. So there's no one size fits all. There's no cookie cutter case plan. And, um, you know, there's really a belief that, you know, disruptive generosity, which may be a new term for some of you, you know, but it's a way to look at how can we disrupt the pathway into, child, into the child welfare system? How can we, you know, use primary prevention, you know, through strategic use of funding you know, to generously work with, you know, partnering with uh, families and the community to help strengthen them, you know, to help prevent entry into the child welfare system, or, you know, if they are involved with the child welfare system to help liberate them from that system, basically, okay? Because we know that the system can be inequitable, okay? And it never feels, you know, um, someone who has an anti-racist mindset, they never feel that people are inferior because everyone is valuable, okay? So it's important that everybody think about their own mindset. Think about where you are. You might be at some place in between two, maybe the assimilationist and the anti-racist. You may have qualities of both, you know? And people often are struggling, you know, to figure out, you know, how can I, I want to move, I want to make some changes, but how do I do that? So it's important to ask yourself who you are and who you're getting your information from. You know, if people around you are saying certain phrases up, oh, you know, I've had people, I, I used to sit next to a guy and I quickly asked to be moved, but, um, you know, I heard him on the phone one day and he, I heard him over telling, he was telling his client, he said, just consider me to be the God of your case. I went to my supervisor. I was like, you know what? I really like him. And I know you want him to help train me, but you know, I think I, I would like to sit with somebody else, you know, and I just kind of was like, I got to get away from this guy, you know, but 
um, I just, that really bothered me because I'm like, I don't need him, you know, around. Um, and it just, I couldn't connect with him at all. You know, somebody like that. Okay. So it's important that, you know, you look at, you know, your mindset, the mindset of your agency, you know, sometimes it's difficult to unlearn old ways of thinking, but, you know, and sometimes, you know, when you're listening to people within your organization, you know, it's important that you think about, you know, pay attention to your own words and thoughts. Think about how you can replace those negative thoughts with positive ones, you know, and look at, you know, where you can seek feedback from, okay? Dr. Price emphasizes the importance of using restorative listening to get to know families which will lead to the creation of a customized adaptive approach to working you know, with families. She uh, shared an example, which I'll read to you. She said, you know, she revised a statement about the role of child welfare uh, using an anti-racist framework. And it reads, um, she was talking about what is the major role of, child wealth, of the child welfare system. And she says, the major role of the child welfare system is to build strategy with strong communities, to partner with vulnerable families, co-creating a safe, well, and stable home environment. Isn't that powerful? Yeah, I like that. So, um, you know, remember that, you know, as you're thinking about mindset, you've taken, you know, the first step towards mind step change by just participating in the workshops that you've been in today. Um, you know, we're working as a group here, you know, to help lift these kinds of ideas and changes in mindset, you know, for social workers and agencies to incorporate into their framework of practice. You know, and we really encourage you to think about this and take a look at it. There's a video that we also have in our resource uh, page uh, and references. So I really encourage you to really take a look at that and watch that video if you haven't. I know many of our students already from our schools have had that opportunity to participate, you know, with uh, Dr. Price and it was quite powerful. Okay. So um, at this time, um, I'll turn it back to Janelle and uh, Elizabeth is going to move our conversation forward. So just... So again, just acknowledging the questions that some of the student reps brought up about like what, what can we do? What can we make? How can we make a difference? Um, have these conversations with your friends. I know if like myself, sometimes my friends who are not social worker, they get, they get tired of me talking like a social worker about social work, social justice and all of these things, but have conversations about what it means to think about the mindset that you are functioning under, the lens through which you are looking at this world. If you're at the county already or another agency, bring it to a unit meeting, pull up the data for your area, take a look and have some conversation about what can we do differently? Where are we functioning? Are we assimilationists? Are we kind of going along and getting along? Because I got that two years of payback. <laughs> I said I was only saying two years. 16 years later, I had to stop saying that. Are we moving towards an anti-racist framework? Remember, an anti-racist framework is not about theory. It is about the practice. It is about taking action and making change. We've all learned theory in class and it's great. It makes a big difference in understanding how or why we are where we are, but we have to move into some action. And so how do we have conversation and dialogue with each other so that we can make those changes? How can we encourage each other to just do one simple thing differently? than the way it's been done all along. So think about that. I thought 
I must have done it because when I went into a house as an ER worker and the person said, oh, Janelle, I've heard of you. You're nice. I'm like, I am an ER social worker. You do not want me up in your house. <laughs> I don't care how nice I am, right? But you're supposed to be part of the community. And so how can you do things differently? And so Elizabeth is going to talk with us a little bit about thinking about evolutionary versus revolutionary. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Chanel. So much information has been shared today. And I'm sitting here overwhelmed as a panelist, um, not just based on what we're seeing, but also based on what we've been able to experience today. Um, before we get to the evolutionary and revolutionary um, aspects of what we want you to consider walking away with today, I, I actually posed this question to my colleagues because I've been struggling with this, what is it, the, the cart before the horse or the egg before the chicken, which comes first? Having formulated that question in my head, I thought, well, I think there's some important information they need to be aware of before we can even get to this place of coming to evolutionary and revolutionary ways of thinking. And a couple of things that I just want to share with you, um, and, and a lot of this information that we're talking about today is information that... Um, please, please, please take some time to look at the presentation that's in the resource box. Um, because Jessica Price, even though we're referencing a lot of the information, did it well. But we wanted to just present some of the concepts. So how do we get to this place? Looking at what are the bricks and stones that has created the system that we are currently working with. And one of those is, we talked about this in other presentations, it's an exclusionary instead of an inclusive system. Some individuals have access to some things that others don't have. You heard it today. Some families have the benefit of walking away with their kids earlier than others. And so that system is a system that our child welfare system is built on. Pre prescriptive rather than adaptive. We talked about cookie cutter uh, case plans. As a public child welfare social worker right out of graduate school, I often had cookie cutter approaches. I've worked in foster care and child welfare most of my professional career before coming into to social work education. So as a social worker, I have to take ownership for some of the things that I did, but we have to figure out as social workers, how do we advocate for those families? We're in relationships with those families. What are some things that we can do to move us outside of that? The other thing is being uh, sanctimonious. We know what is right or moral instead of humanistic. So looking at what is the individual needs of this family? Yes, I understand there is a case plan. There's a judge, there's a supervisor. There are all of these, these things that we have to be mindful of. But I'm also saying, and the panelists and the presenters before us, that it's going to take the social worker, the family, the community, the agency, all of us working together to work towards this change. Lastly, being myopic instead of forward thinking so that we're not just thinking, we're not thinking about what is going on with this family and what are the long-term implications of this. So when we talk about the disproportionality data, what is the long-term impact and impl implication of that? So we have to think forward thinking as a part of that and we haven't been doing that. So those are some of the, the stones and the bricks that have built the child welfare system that we have talked about today. And also, um, again, the history that is referenced in, in the video presentation, if you could take some time to look at that. So as we look at looking, um, making evolutionary and revolutionary changes, we have to understand what does that mean? And I'm going to go through this quickly because we have one more presenter. I wanna make sure there's time. Evolutionary is, what is inevitable? And uh, from, a, from a student perspective, one of the things that I did was I looked at Webster's Dictionary, right? You all Google things, right? <laughs> so uh, Webster says, if you're looking at evolutionary, you're looking at maybe thinking some, uh, maybe taking something that already exists to keep it stable or functioning, or even at the status quo. Sometimes thinking about what is a Band-Aid that you can put on something just to keep it going. And so when you look at evolutionary, sometimes it's looking at what you do from A to B to C, not necessarily looking at what the individualized needs of the families. So 
evolutionary, you're looking at change to ensure that something happens. So you want to make sure that, yeah, you want to keep that child safe in the home. Yes, you want to maybe make sure that those ch children are removed, but you may be just doing the same thing, cookie cutter that you've done with all cases, not looking at the needs of that individual child. Surface level, one size fits all. We don't want to do that anymore with our families. We want to know that the families have the information that we need to better understand. Ultimately, with evolutionary, you're looking at um, how to protect children and help those children within those families. Yes, it's about safety of the children in the home. But we're, if we're looking at revolutionary, we're looking at, sorry, I'm going to Google it. Would, would, um, we want to look at what would we be working towards to cause a complete or drastic change, something that's totally different. So profound, fundamental, transform, transformational. Some of the things that you've heard, you've, there's been reference to up in movement, the blind removal. Those are things that will make significant changes in the system that would, in which we work. Uh, complete overhaul and reconstruction reshaping, realigning, strategic goals and mission. We heard a lot about that in uh, 2020 with a lot of things that were going on after the George Floyd murders and everything in relation to Black Lives Matter, but also with uh, Indian child welfare as well. We have to look at a, a system change, examining the root cause. Um, I just laid out some of the things and reasons that has gotten us to this place. As a part of that, when you're looking at uh, revolutionary changes, you're looking at ensuring children have an uninterrupted sense of belonging, strengthening family. So instead of moving those children from family to family to family, what are the ways that we can keep children in their existing families, in their existing communities, continue to uh, strengthen those lives of children, right? So that we're not having children move from home to home with trash bags or garbage bags. Uh, and their uh, belongings. So I know there's a lot more information we want to be able to share. So I'm going to turn it back over to Janelle. Thank you. Okay. So we wanted to, to share with you this one example when Dr. Price asked all of our students who are participating about the things that they could see change um, that would make a big difference. And I think a couple of quick ones to point out are, you know, putting parents first, uh, really in looking at community empowerment and giving more than lip service to the idea of social change. And so with that, um, Mika's gonna take us into another practical way to think about what we can do as we walk away today. Hi, everyone. I have one minute. Is it okay if I take some of the Q&A time to talk about this? Is that cool with you all? Perfect. Okay. I just wanted some buy-in and permission. <laughs> okay. So I'm Mika. I'm a project coordinator at Chico State. And uh, selfishly, thank you all for being here, right? We're in a room with like-minded people. I think I can make that assumption. Yeah. We care about this topic deep, deeply. We want to do the work deeply. And we're all here together, sort of vibing with each other. And I just want to say thank you, selfishly. Uh, it means a lot to me. So I will keep my part pretty brief because I don't need to repeat what folks have already said. Um, working with this group has been amazing. Go find yourself a group of people to work closely with. It's important for self-care to have people who hold space for you. And we've been doing that for each other and with each other for a year and a half, meeting every other week on purpose with intentionality. And it helps. I'm just going to say, find your people. Uh, and selfishly, I'm just going to label all my selfish feelings as selfish because that helps me think that they're okay. Selfishly, it's helped me progress in who I am in this work as well. Does that make sense? Find people who hold you accountable, but also hold space for your questions. So thank you, group. I'm just full of gratitude because I get to go briefly. <laughs> and that feels kind of good. Okay. So one of the things we've been working on is what can we do as individuals? What, how can my practice be different? What can I do to uphold this 
new understanding, or perhaps it's not new, but the shared understanding of disproportionality and systemic racism? How am I not contributing to the system that is based on white supremacy, white supremacy culture, bias, racism? How do I do this work differently and feel good about my work in this system that does harm to families and has historically been created to do harm to families? Have you all been thinking about that too? What can you do as individuals in the work? Does that feel important? Yeah, great, thank you. Um, one of the things that brought us together as a group was just that, what can we be doing differently? And not unlike the poem that Janelle shared at the beginning, which we'll revisit, we sort of sat around as project coordinators too. Who's gonna start talking about this? When is it gonna start making it to the agenda? When is this feeling like the ongoing conversation we need to have? And then we went, well, maybe we could do that. So we got together as a group, we requested time, we requested assistance from CalSWEC and guess what? They said yes. We have um, worked together to look at what we're doing individually. We lifted up each other's stories. We've watched videos together over Zoom for hours. We've um, recommended television shows, movies, quotes, books. Uh, we've talked about the work of amazing scholars who's been mentioned here before. And we just kept the conversation going. We've been meeting for a year and a half every other week and we've kept the conversation going. That feels important to me, right? And we're doing it on purpose and with intention. So what can you do as individuals? Well, we learned of this um, idea called the 15% solutions and you'll see the slide up um, next to me and it's in the resource uh, folder as well. And this is something we learned from Dr. Ghali, who may be here on the YouTube uh, webinar today. And if so, thank you for your partnership, Dr. Ghali, and introducing us to some amazing curriculum um, that Elizabeth had mentioned through the Academy of Professional Excellence, specifically the work around cultural responsiveness. And what Dr. Ghali talked to us about was this idea about 15% of what we do is within our control we can change it, we can adapt it, we can update it, we can upgrade it, and we can reassess it as we go. And paying attention to the 15% you have control over can feel like a little bit of a relief because you don't have to worry about what everyone else is doing. You can do your work in the way that feels important and meaningful to you and the families that you're serving, and that's why we're here, is to impact the lives of families in a way that feels good and minimizing the harm so what Dr. Golly does, I'm sorry, I wrote so many notes. Were you all inspired today writing like little things that people said all day long that now my notes feel like very unhelpful? It's inspiring and you want to say what everyone else said. Okay. What Dr. Golly's curriculum asks is that social workers engage in some self-reflection around this 15%. And the 15% is essentially this. It asks you to look at those things in your work that you have control over. It helps you refocus your energy to those things that feel doable. It can minimize your frustration and it lets you know the things that feel meaningful to you are within your power and control. And you can change the way you do the work as you learn new information. I shared that I am still in the process of learning, right? Shouldn't we always be in the process of learning? So each time I re-reflect on where I'm at, I can make upgrades to my practice. And so the 15% solution says, reflect on some questions that get you to that 15%. And some of the questions in the curriculum that Dr. Ghali has worked um, uh, in, with child welfare workers around are these questions. I'm just gonna read them because they're great. How can you advocate for African-American families who are involved in the child welfare system? How can you? How can you also advocate for your coworkers who are African-American and working in the child welfare system? Each other. What strengths do you bring that allow you to be an effective advocate? Focus on what you bring as a worker. What tools are already in place that help you utilize advocacy on behalf of African-American families? or that you can use to navigate differences in power dynamics. And the last question I'll share, how do you advocate to address issues associated with systemic racism? So if we can ask ourselves these questions, we can ask our colleagues, our units, our supervisors, our people, 
we can come to a place of understanding what's in our power and our control that we can use in our practice. Is that making sense so far? So I'm gonna do just a little two minute version of this activity. Normally you would spend a lot of time with it. However, you can bring this conversation outside of this room ongoing and with intention. And so folks on the webinar can use the chat bar. Folks in the room, we're gonna do what we did before, turn to a neighbor for two minutes. And I just want you to think about all of the things you've been inspired by today, things that you've heard or learned, things that you've been wondering about. And this is sort of a call to action, if you will. What might you be including in your practice after today? So here's the question you're gonna chat with, chat about. What can I do in my practice today that helps me be the change that I want to see within the child welfare system? Does that make sense? Two minutes real quick. I think it's the same. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, the poem to revisit. That's it. Yeah, great. Just felt like I had to make it up, so I felt like I was stuttering. No, you weren't stuttering. Okay. Thanks. Very clear. I just had to, I felt like I was making it up in the moment because I have like 10 minutes of stuff. So I'm like, <laughs> I, love this. This is so I think so too. That's okay. Better to open. I had, I had to go to the novel by Cheryl. Go. So I was like, shift and the whole mindset. Yep, that's right. Right at the moment. What can I do today to yep. shift my mindset and get this done? You know, Such wonderful conversation again. I hate to interrupt you, but I must because Rose is going to give me the stink eye in just a few minutes. <laughs> okay. I love it. Did we get any comment in the chat on this one? Is there any table that wants to share briefly? Yes. Oh, oh. oh excuse me, sorry. Sorry, testing Mike, you can hear me? Yeah. Okay, so um, we were talking about how this um, whole entire workshop is added uh, fuel to the flame because with the whole Title IV E raise the stipend thing, we were really getting, um, our whole class wanted to be a part of it, but the professor was like, you shook us up and everybody got scared, but some of us was like, no, we're going to take a stand no matter what it takes. So I want to say thank you for adding that fuel to us. So now we're going to go further. Thank you. Thank you. Is there another old table? Powerful and mighty. Okay, hi. Hi. So I am a social worker in ER and I come from a predominantly white county. I have the um, blessing to work with the only two African-American social workers employed with our county, and it's fantastic. We have a great group. But in ER, we often, well, we don't have a lot of African-American children, but we do have a lot of Hispanic children that come into care. And um, in ER, we often have to do emergency home approvals. And we're placing these children into white homes. And I was saying, if I was a foster mother and I became a foster mother to an African-American little girl, I would not know what to do with her hair. Mm -hmm. If I, right now we have a lot of um, children crossing the border 
without their parents, unaccompanied minors, and we're having to put them into care and they don't know any English. And again, we don't have a lot, uh, enough Hispanic homes to care for these children. And so we're putting them into white homes and they, they don't know the language, they don't know the foods. So really this, um, we need to do something about the disparities of foster homes and really serving the children that we are actually having to put into care. If we have to put them into care, I want them to be cared for appropriately. Thank you. So we had a similar um, sentiment. I'm in the back. Similar sentiment in the live stream chat um, where an individual in the chat was encouraging like diverse representation of workers in child welfare services. So encouraging that um, we make more diverse settings in our workplaces. Great, thank you. Well, hello, thank you. Um, same as our neighbor's table right here, I think we're fired up to call it as it is. We have been fired up for a while. Um, and I, we were just sharing like, we do not have to agree. We have the right to disagree, but then we have to speak about it. Yes. And not just to uh, whoever or supervisor or management, but between each other, because I cannot do so. If I don't disagree, most likely she's not going to agree. And there's two of us and then three and four and five yes. and then more of us. And so we can do a change. Yes. Gosh, I just got chills. I love it. I love it. I love it. We thank you guys so much for being willing to share. And I'm hoping that as I reread this as our final note, that it hits a little bit different than maybe at the beginning. Again, there was an important job to be done. And everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do, but nobody realized that everybody couldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have. And so I'm hoping that this time that you have spent together today with each other from different schools, listening to the various presentations, that you will realize that you are somebody who can make a difference, that you are the, the individual that can encourage a, a group or a team and a team or a group that can encourage an agency and an agency that can encourage and strengthen and empower a community that can make a difference and change the way people view the work that we have committed to in child welfare. So the next time you go someplace public and you say, oh, I work for child welfare for CPS, people won't go, oh. <laughs> Oh, that's God's work. That's wonderful. Oh, they're going to go, yes. We love how you are making a change and how you are standing up for the community. We love how you are taking what our communities have used to survive decades and decades and decades and decades of oppression and abuse. We love that you are willing to stand there on the wall for the children and families of this community. Thank you so much. We hope you're inspired. Let's give it up. Let's give it up. Thank you. Thank you all so much. We're so honored to hold on to this. We're so honored to have all of you. Um, here today. Thank you again to our panel. Thank you again to our presenters um, throughout the day. Uh, my name is Rose Shala. I will be providing, you all welcome to stay up here and hang out with me if you want, but you're welcome to run off too. That's fine. Um, we're just going to spend two or three more minutes. Okay, she's running. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. I understand. Um, 
We're gonna spend a few more minutes just giving appreciation and closing out today's event. Cause as we know, it's important to just process and appreciate, right? Um, and I have some gift cards too. So that, that helps incentivize things a bit. Okay, so we have to thank again, our presenters today. Can we give a hand to our presenters and panelists? Obviously without these workshops and panels, uh, it would just be some snacks and bingo. And that as great as that is, we um, are so enriched by your expertise and the presenters who, who were so generous to share that with us today. So we appreciate you so much. Um, this is our extensive planning committee. Let's give them a hand. This includes Title IV-E students on the student planning committee our CalSWIC staff supporting them. This has been a nine month collaboration, feels like seven years, but nine months to, to bring us all back from our virtual, used to be in person, went virtual after the pandemic. Now we're back in person. This is our first in-person event in I think three years. So thank you all for coming and thank you all for supporting. Uh, we had a workshop welcome and media committee who did put this all together for you today. And I also want to give some acknowledgement to our three chairs. If you're still here, can you all stand up? Monse. <laughs> Monse, Annie, Annie Rose, and Jay. Thank you. I see you in the back. <laughs> uh, you're all amazing. It was lovely to work with you. Um, and our Calswick leads. Um, that's me. I'm Rose. Um, and, <laughs> and Christina, my partner in crime this year. I appreciate you so much. Yeah, give Christina a wave. And uh, Mauricio, Mauricio, come on. I know. Don't hide behind your computer. Okay, he's hiding. He's hiding. It's fine. He's tired. Um, so Mauricio has helped build our live stream over the last seven years. Uh, today we had about, I think, up to 250 people log in uh, for these sessions. So that's amazing and just want to appreciate you all on the live stream for joining us today and Mauricio for supporting us with that. Oops, sorry. So we got to talk a little bit of money. So thank you CDSS for your ongoing support of this event. And thank you to NASW California for sponsoring um, our event in Calswick as well. Uh, we, you know, we want to just give a little shout out. If you are a graduating student, look into NASW California. Haven't if you haven't already for some membership details. Um, and I really want to thank our Hilton Oakland Airport staff. Y'all helped us run this event as well. So let's give them a, a hand too. Thank you. And I also want to thank all of you, all you attendees. Again, this would be an empty room with us stressed planners if you weren't all here. So thank you for joining us, um, whether you are on YouTube or in person. Oh, <laughs> okay, uh, I don't know what this is. <laughs> do i need to, i click it i did click it uh, i don't have the clicker i don't have the clicker <laughs> this is i i'm obviously caught off guard right now oh i'm hiding the clicker thank you i don't oh here we go okay hello everyone i'm carolyn Shin, director the Title IV-E program at CalSWEC Central. I'm sorry I'm not able to be in person at the summit this year, but I wanted to take a moment to jump in and thank Roshala, Assistant Director of the 4 e program, for being the driving force behind the summit since its inauguration. Under her leadership, the summit has continued to evolve and meet the shifting needs of the child welfare workforce as practice continues to change and a global pandemic impacted the way we all live and work. Rose has contributed to positive and unique professional development experiences for students on the planning committee and to the diverse group of summit attendees through timely and relevant workshops and activities. She has also provided direction and support to colleagues here at CalSWEC Central to ensure smooth fiscal and logistical operations of this massive event. Rose will continue as assistant director of the program while summit planning activities will shift next year. In the meantime, please join me in sending heartfelt gratitude to all the staff and students who put work into making the summit a success, particularly Rose for putting such dedication, attention to detail and passion into her work. Thank you.
Stay home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's so sweet. I uh, was just going to talk about evaluations, but <laughs> thank, that's so kind. Thank you all for your yeah lovely feedback and for Carolyn for that. Um, I was going to talk about evaluations. <laughs> so um, okay, if you all um, if you all will, we're going to announce some gift card winners shortly. Um, for those of you who are still with us online, we I will email you about if you win. Um, but you're all still eligible to enter for a gift card draw for the evaluate if you complete the evaluation. So please fill that out. Um, and you have until I think next Wednesday to fill that out. So do it. Uh, all right. And then if you if you're still in the room with us, hang with us for a second. I have two more items for you. If you're a live stream attendee, um, we will bid you adieu. Thank you again for joining us virtually. Um, have a great day. Let's give them a wave. Bye. <laughs> okay. Oh, I see. I see. All right. Okay. So see these, are they, are you still wearing these? All right. Take them off. <laughs>